Bandwidth and sample speed are the two most important specs for a new oscilloscope, but what do you actually know about them? Welcome to Overkill Projects, I'm Walt, and today we're going to take a look at those specs and a few more and try to demystify the entire buying process so that you can get the scope that serves you best. Let's do it. That is way too much. <laughs> Scopes and other gear can certainly seem sexy to people, some people. But clearing away a lot of the marketing material and taking a look at what the scope can actually do uh, will benefit you much more in the long run than getting addicted to the idea of having a better scope or a bigger, better piece of gear. Now, of course, an oscilloscope is probably the most important part of your workbench. So you definitely want to understand what it is you're getting and make sure that you get enough. And the first thing we're going to talk about bandwidth is a huge part of that equation. The idea of bandwidth sounds super simple if you just sort of state it in a vacuum as a definition. The bandwidth figure that they have written there on your oscilloscope is just the frequency at which the input signal will be attenuated at 3 dB. And just real quick, 3 dB down or negative 3 dB or decibels is just the point at which we would say that the signal has been significantly attenuated. And when we talk about decibels of difference in terms of voltage, the formula is simply given by 20 times the base 10 log of the voltage of one signal divided by the voltage of another signal. And to give you an idea of some of the limitations of your scope, here's a quick example. I took a quick measurement with a 100 megahertz scope using a signal generator sweeping through frequencies from 500 hertz all the way up to 100 megahertz. And looking at this, you might think that you're going to get a pretty good representation of your scope's performance over these frequencies. But you'd be wrong. At least one major ingredient in this entire mix often goes very much overlooked, and that is the probes themselves. The measurement you see here was actually taken with a 500 megahertz probe, and as this is a 100 megahertz oscilloscope, you might think that that's enough to overcome any sort of performance problems in the probe itself, but that's definitely not true. And it is the case that if I was to take the same measurement with my 100 megahertz probe, I'll see worse performance, or at least different performance. And in fact, I did that, you can see it here. And so comparing the two signals, you see that the 100 megahertz probes definitely attenuate more than the 500 megahertz probes. But that opens us up to the question of what are we actually seeing here? This is supposed to be a one volt peak to peak sweep, but we can see that it's not. So are the performance limitations a product of the function generator of the scopes probes or of the scope itself? Or is it some other problem? It turns out that the answer to this or an attempt at an answer to this goes pretty well beyond the scope of this particular video. If you're looking for a more in-depth explanation, just Tell me in the comments below and I'll try to make a video on that soon. It's actually been my experience that most scopes I have perform slightly better than the bandwidth figure listed. And that is both a good thing and a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. Naively, you might think that you should just get the highest frequency scope that you can afford because you'll be able to measure faster signals. Great, right? Well, not quite because the picture is a little bit more complicated than that. So for example, take a 20 megahertz square wave at one volt peak to peak. While well, a 20 megahertz bandwidth oscilloscope should be enough to handle that, right? Not only is that scope not fast enough, it's not fast enough by a pretty significant margin. In our example, we're talking about a square wave and a square wave is actually made up of a whole bunch of sine waves and these sine waves are called harmonics. So for a 20 megahertz square wave, we have a fundamental or a root harmonic of 20 megahertz. That's just a sine wave that travels at 20 megahertz. But then you have to add to that a proportion of all the odd harmonics of that root harmonic. When we talk about nth harmonics, we really just mean that we're gonna take integer multiples of our root frequency. So in this case, the first root or fundamental harmonic would be 20 megahertz. The second harmonic would be 40 megahertz. The third harmonic would be 60 the fourth would be 80, and the fifth would be at 100 megahertz. Now, like I said, for a square wave, you actually only take the odd harmonics, which leaves you with the 20 megahertz, 40 meg, no, 20 megahertz, 20 megahertz, 20 megahertz, 60 megahertz, and 100 megahertz signals. And so now back to our 20 megahertz square wave, if we want to get a precise waveform on our oscilloscope up to the fifth harmonic, then we need at least 100 megahertz worth of bandwidth. And so really, if we go back to our definition of the bandwidth of our scope, 
We should say that the number on the scope represents the fastest frequency that the scope can measure a one volt peak to peak sine wave before attenuating it at 3 dB. And it turns out that for most of the signal shapes that you'd care about getting the first five harmonics is enough to get a really good picture of what the signal actually looks like. And you'll often hear this referred to as the times five rule for oscilloscopes. The idea being that if you know you want to measure signals at a given frequency, call that frequency F, then you want to buy an oscilloscope that can measure frequency five times F. And now's a good time to mention that a signal of a given frequency is made up of different proportions of all the harmonics of the root harmonic. And now this idea shouldn't seem foreign to you. It turns out that we see this a lot in everyday life. In music, if you play a note on an instrument, say a middle C on a guitar, that's going to sound different than if you play a middle C on a piano. This is a result of the different instruments using different proportions of the harmonics of the root harmonic to build the sound. It's what makes a piano sound like a piano and a guitar sound like a guitar. While we're talking about bandwidth, we might as well talk about a very closely associated spec and that is your scope's rise time. Just like with frequency, having your scope able to measure a fast enough rise time means that you're going to have a higher signal fidelity or waveform fidelity than you would with a slower rise time. In almost all cases, you're going to see the rise time for the scope listed according to one of two different equations. For scopes under 1 gigahertz, you're going to see it listed as 0.3 divided by the scope's bandwidth. And for scopes over 1 gigahertz, you usually see it listed as 0.4 divided by the scope's bandwidth. That coefficient of 0.3 or 0.4 isn't particularly mysterious. We can actually derive it ourselves pretty quickly. A one volt peak to peak sine wave at frequency F is given by this equation. And since rise time is a measure of how long it takes for a signal to go from 10% of its maximum strength to 90% of its maximum strength, we're going to set this equal to plus or minus 0.4 and then solve for T. The difference between those two T's then is the rise time. So solving first for positive 0.4, we get this, and solving for negative 0.4, we get this. And so taking their difference, we get a result of this, which is very close to the 0.3 coefficient that is used to derive your specs. Now let's talk a little bit about the sampling rate of your scope. The sampling rate or sampling speed of your scope is just the number of samples or measurements that your scope can take every second. So for instance, a 100 mega sample per second scope can take 100,000, no. 100 million samples per second. Similarly, similar, <coughs> similarly, and similarly, and similarly, a two giga sample per second scope can take two billion samples every second. But to even talk about sampling speed already exposes an underlying issue of your digital scope, and that is that it can only take discrete measurements every once in a while. But of course, your incoming signal is continuous, and it's a big part of your scope's job to take that discrete data and turn it into something that you can see as continuous data. Now's also a good time to define memory depth. Death. Now's also a good time to define memory depth. You can get the memory depth of your scope by multiplying the size of your window, the width of your window, by the sample rate. So for example, if you had a window that was 100 milliseconds wide on a scope that does two giga samples per second, then you would need 200 mega points or 200 million points of memory in order to save all of the data gathered for that waveform. But then again, a 100 millisecond window is relatively huge if you're trying to measure it at two giga samples per second. If instead we had a window of 50 nanoseconds on the same scope, we would only need 100 samples or 100 points worth of memory in order to store the data for that waveform. Most new scopes have at least a few mega samples or mega points of memory, and you can usually set how much memory you want the scope to use at any given time. Let's take a look at a simple example where the scope actually fails to give us an accurate representation of the incoming signal. I set up my function generator to give me a pulse that has a width of about 26 nanoseconds, which is about a 20 megahertz or so signal. Here I had my scope set up for 10 milliseconds per division, and since there's 14 divisions, that's 140 milliseconds. My scope also has the ability for me to change the amount of memory that I use, so I set it for 14,000 points of data. Here each individual dot represents a sample taken by the oscilloscope, and you can see that the scope was only able to capture one point from our pulse. What this means is that when our scope goes to fill in the gaps or interpolate the data, 
we're not going to get an accurate picture of the actual signal. Instead, what we're gonna get in this example is a simple sine X on X or sync wave. On this scope, I also have the ability to go in and change that from sine X on X interpolation to just X interpolation, which is also called linear interpolation. And if I do that, we'll just see a triangle. But a triangle is also not representative of the incoming pulse. So then the question is, how many samples do we actually need before we get an accurate picture of the incoming pulse? And to answer this, we need to go back to bandwidth and something called the Nyquist rate. The Nyquist rate is a lot less mystical than it sounds. It's just two times the frequency that we're dealing with. And don't get this confused with the Nyquist frequency, which is half of the rate if we're talking about sampling rate. In our example, we're talking about a pulse from about a 20 megahertz signal, which means that when we talk about Nyquist rate, we are looking for a sampling frequency of about 40 mega samples per second. Remember before when we discussed bandwidth, we said that you needed five times the bandwidth of the fastest frequencies you wanted to measure in order to get the number of harmonics needed to recreate at least somewhat faithfully the incoming signal. But as I pointed out, a square wave is actually made up of an infinite number of odd harmonics. It should be obvious that it's not possible for any scope to measure a wide enough frequency to get an infinite number of harmonics. Instead, when we use a 100 megahertz scope and we look at, say, a 20 megahertz sine wave, we know, we expect that we can recover those first three odd harmonics up to the fifth harmonic. This is going to give us a certain representation of a square wave. It turns our incoming analog signal into what we would call a band limited signal. The nice thing about a band limited signal is that if we sample that signal above the Nyquist rate, then when we interpolate by the sync function, we're going to get a perfect representation of that band limited signal. This is such an important result that it actually has its own name in mathematics and signal processing science. It's actually called the Nyquist-Shannon theorem. But it really is a great principle that we can rely on because it lets us know that we can accurately reconstruct what our scope sees on the screen. And this all works out because the Fourier transform of a rectangle function is a sync function. But remember that all of this relies on the idea that we actually know the bandwidth limit on our incoming signal. This is actually such an important idea that most modern scopes actually have some extra band limiting features built in. For instance, my scope can measure up to 100 megahertz, but it actually has a very easy option for me to turn the bandwidth limit down to 20 megahertz. You actually run into two major problems when trying to actually sample a real life band limited signal. The first is a simple mathematical fact that's actually relatively easy to prove that says that a signal cannot be both band limited and time limited at the same time. But of course, it should come as no surprise to you that the measurement of all your incoming signals is time limited. You don't have an infinite amount of time to sample data around your signal. Instead, your scope is time limited and usually to the width of your window. And since this measurement is necessarily time limited and therefore it cannot really be band limited, that means that your scope is not capable of giving you a perfect reconstruction of the band limited incoming signal. Luckily, the practical impact of this fact is very small and in fact so small that it's not really even anything to worry about. A much bigger worry is our second problem, which is that since our pulse signal is not a periodic signal, it means we actually have to sample at a much faster rate than the Nyquist rate. And so the general rule of thumb when you're buying a scope is that you want the sample rate to be at least five times the bandwidth. And the truth is in most modern scopes, you're actually gonna see a sample rate even higher than that. And so if we go back and take a look at our example, sampling below the Nyquist rate and at the maximum rate of the scope, which is well above the Nyquist rate, we can see the difference in the reconstruction that the oscilloscope affords us. All right, that was a lot of information for one video, especially for someone's first video, which this was. If you found it at all helpful, please hit the like button. If you wanna get my updates, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the alerts button. Thank you so much for watching and since you made it all the way through my first video, uh, I have a little bit of fun for you. Here is just a little bit more oscilloscope pornography. Thank you.